My name is Sean Tracy. Chevette Yearly, that's how. <laughs> um, I mean, he's our, he's our creative director. He, takes, he does reviews on every single level. He'll do personal reviews with each designer uh, to make sure that it is his vision. Basically what you're seeing up here is Sandbox. So some of the things we've made improvements to is obviously the user interface. If you've seen Sandbox 2 or even older, uh, just a little bit older version of Sandbox, this UI is not nearly as nice. Uh, it's a much easier UI to use and we've also added a lot of tools within it. And the first tool to note is that we've added these uh, stereo settings within here. So now a designer or an artist can actually just select the type of stereo he wants to show. So now we're in uh, pure 3D here, so I can preview everything that I want to do in 3D. Uh, this is obviously a really nice tool to be able to have, um, just because we're seeing it on our target platform. We're seeing it exactly as the player is going to see it. So the other thing that we've made improvements to is this uh, HDR flares. So this is a really cool HDR flare effect that we have coming off all the lights now. So it's just a little more realistic, so that's kind of nice. And of course, we always have the what you see is what you play. Now, what you see is what you play is obviously essential at Crytek just because we want to always be able to iterate and then play, iterate then play. Um, and of course, you know, everything's realistic and, uh, and, and reacting when in the world. So I can hit this, I can shoot that light around a little bit. And we see that all the shadows update in real time. I just shoot, shot that box in front of the light and it's actually got the shadow there now. So I'll go ahead and uh, switch off my stereo there for a second. And now we'll uh, keep going through the demo. So what we can also do is, uh, I didn't show you much of this last time, and uh, we'll move around an object. So I can just grab objects. Uh, we can move them around really easily. Uh, it's just a matter of a, you know, 3D gizmo and all the shadows update in real time. Uh, the other cool thing that we can do is actually some sort of physical simulation. So because we have integrated physics, I can just apply this impulse to this uh, object, and it actually falls down and reacts in the world. Now what's kind of cool about this is uh, maybe I want it to you know, roll somewhere and then I'll save the state for it so that it's, it's always in that same place. So it's rolled up there. It's a really realistic placement. So if I want to save that, uh, save where it is, I can just go physical state, save state, and it's also saved, and now that's, up, that's placed. So it's really cool, physical placement of objects. It's just a nice way for designers to work. So some of the other things that we've got um, is obviously the lighting system. So now I'm just gonna copy this out. And as you see, as I copy that out, we can actually uh, <laughs> physically interact with things within the world if we have AI on, uh, AI and physics on. And let's turn that back on again here for a second. And as you see, as I move it through the world, I can kick around these boxes, I can do all sorts of stuff, which is pretty fun, actually. So that's kind of neat. But uh, the main reason to show this is that uh, you can see that all those shadows uh, on the back wall there from the uh, boxes, that all updates in real time. So uh, not a lot of other engines can do this. Um, a lot of them are uh, baking their light maps, which is the idea. So they can't move around lights like this in real time. So let me move a little bit further now uh, with the uh, lights here. And we're actually going to set up a little scene uh, within one of the hallways here. So one thing we found when we're running in stereo, uh, I'll just turn it on again for a second so we can have a look. So dark scenes um, don't do so well in stereo. It's, it's not that it's bad stereo. The stereo is the exact same. You just don't notice it as much. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to get some lights in here and a couple of particle effects and we'll make it look a little cooler. So I go to no stereo output and uh, I open up my database view. Now I'm just on one screen here so this is going to be a little bit tricky. So in here we have our uh, particles library and this is not something I showed you there before. But uh, I can just go to a certain particle library and uh, grab whatever particle effect I want and I can just drag that out into the world. So now I want this particle effect to be somewhere in this uh, that little uh, broken sort of valve. And as you can see, we've got this really wicked HDR coming off that particle effect. Now the next thing is, um, because we've had fire in here, we likely have a lot of light. So let's get a light in this scene. Go to lights, grab a light, and I just throw it down into the world. And like you can see, as I move it around, it all updates in real time. So I'm just gonna decrease the radius a little bit. And I'm going to place it just so I see a little bit of specular on that back wall. Oh, where is this light? There we go. So now we've got some nice specular happening on that back wall. And uh, because this is a nice fire effect, I probably want some orange color. So I can just sample the color right from the particle effect. So maybe I want this sort of orange color for the light. So I mean, that, this is really nice to be able to do. Uh, I'm going to try to get a little bit better here. Something like that. And now I turn up my diffuse multiplier. 
and that looks a lot more realistic already. So now to make it really cool, uh, I just add a light style, and light styles are kind of interesting because they make lights flicker and do all sorts of uh, all sorts of animation. I can even change the rate at which it animates, so I'm going to change it to about a two because this fire is coming out pretty fast. So now uh, going a little bit further, uh, I'll open up my database view again, and we'll just get a second particle in there because I want to make this uh, a little more interesting, definitely. So the, uh, the other particle effect I want to put in is uh, on the ceiling. Um, likely there's going to be smoke and embers and stuff coming from that ceiling, right? Um, so, you know, I place this in here and we get a nice fire effect coming off the ceiling. I'm just going to turn off my snap objects and we'll just get the placement of this real nice. Uh, somewhere around there. I mean, maybe back a little bit would look better. But this looks a lot more realistic now. So something really cool about all of this is, uh, oh, I don't have the button for it, but I want to still show you it, um, so I'll have to type it into the console. So uh, I'm going to turn on 3D, and we'll have a look at how this looks. So cool, much more 3D now, just because we have some light in there. Um, but what I want to show you as well is uh, that we have this uh, thermal vision. So basically, uh, with this, I can just uh, pop up my console. I go our... Usually I have a button for this. All right, so now we have a thermal vision, which is really awesome. So you can see that there's actual heat coming off that fire. There's heat coming off the ceiling and the smoke. And what we can do is it's really easy for us to actually modify this. Uh, I'm just going to turn off stereo so I can sample a uh, material. And uh, maybe I want these pipes to actually be hot um, because, I mean, there's probably hot steam or something within those pipes. So I'm just going to move this over here. And you see, it's really easy for us artists to, to change this. All I have to do is grab this heat amount and turn it up. I mean, it's really, really easy stuff to do. So now we have this hot pipe and the hot fire and the hot ceiling. So this thermal stuff is really good. And again, we'll just do the post stereo, jump in game. And as you can see, what you see is what you play is just so powerful. So uh, this looks awesome. We've got post effects, we've got stereo, we've got thermal, everything's happening at once. So I'm just going to throw off stereo here for a second and turn off my thermal vision and we'll move on a little bit. All right. So now uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, well, actually, we're going to turn it off again anyway. So let's go ahead and move uh, a little bit further into the level here. Now, as I move up the stairway, uh, I have this little track view sequence. And track view is what we use to sort of animate objects within the world. It's like a compositing tool, really. So I have the stairwell collapsing cutscene. So it's not actually a cutscene, sorry. It's, it's more like a quick time event. Um, so this is not going to take the camera away from the player, but it sort of induces gameplay because now the player is going to have to jump across, right? So what I can do is I actually want to put some sort of trigger um, so that the player actually triggers that cutscene. And where I want to put it is that, that first, uh, the sort of first uh, corner. So let's go ahead and grab a proximity trigger. Oops. All right. And now we put that in the world, so there it is there. I'll just put it up against that wall, maybe drop it down a little bit, somewhere around there. Okay, so now we actually have to set up this trigger. So what we do, we create a new flow graph, and we go new, and uh, I'll just call it collapse. And now what's nice about flow graph is it's really fast to do. Um, so now I just add this proximity trigger. Yeah, if you take off your glasses for a sec, you can see that it says uh, disable, uh, enable, enter. So this enter actually outputs some sort of signal. So what I want to signal is the animation system. So it goes to play sequence. And I'm just going to select that collapse sequence. And we go on enter, trigger that sequence. And as well, I want to add a bit of a camera shake on there just because it would be more interesting. So enable trigger. And we got the little camera shake in there. Just put a preset on. And that's it. So there's no saving, there's no compilation, there's nothing else that needs to happen. So I'm just going to close that off, I'll close my track view, and we'll turn on stereo and we'll see how that looks. So again, having this one button click stereo is uh, very powerful. So now I jump in game, the stairway's still there. As the player comes up, he's going to look around left, and then boom, the stairway comes down. So that's how easy it is for us to set up these triggers. I mean, it really doesn't take very long at all. So now I'm going to move into the main area of the level, and I want to show you some of the cool destructibles that we're using now. So uh, I want to show you this. Uh, uh, this is also kind of a neat gun. I can pull this gun now off these uh, off these racks. So this is something cool in Crisis 2. So now 
These particular destructibles are pre-baked type destructibles, so we've already broken that up. Uh, it's just really high performance on the console. So a lot of these uh, we've pre-broken. Then we have a more procedural one like this wall. So we have entire wall pieces coming down. Uh, this looks really exciting in stereo actually. So if I come up uh, a little bit closer to this wall here, and then we uh, shoot off one of these wall pieces, you got those falling down at you in stereo. So you can see that you get these really cool effects happening. Uh, a little bit further than that, uh, we've got these interesting designer destructibles across the way there. If I shoot that, you see that the first sign falls down and then we have a little rope actually right in that corner that's holding it there. Um, so these are, uh, we call them designer destructibles because the designer actually just took a couple objects and put constraints together to make them do that. Um, so it's a really easy for designers to do. Uh, and then finally we have another designer destructible up here. Now hopefully I can, nope, I'm going to have to use my other gun. So I'll throw that one away. Ooh, not the shotgun. There we go. So what I can do is just hit it once. If I have better aim, there we go. So if I hit it once, we get a little bit of uh, sway happening because there's two constraints there. One is up here and another one down here. But if I really unload on this, then it's going to break off and turn off the light. I can even run around and push this around in the world. Uh, so, you know, you can make a soccer game or make some gameplay out of that. So that's cool. So I'm going to place uh, one of the new AI entities in the world. So this is uh, called the Stalker. And actually, you guys didn't, uh, didn't get a chance to see this at E3. Uh, he's a really cool creature though. Uh, he's very, very nimble. He moves around the world really, really well. Um, so there's a couple things in the world. And you see these, uh, these yellow objects, a so wall jump and things like this. What these are called are AI smart objects. So basically what can happen is if the AI's pathfinding goes through one of these smart objects, it knows to do an animation, exactly, right? Um, so that's really cool. Always or just Always. Um, so if it, only when it pathfinds through it. So it doesn't always pathfind through it is the thing. So uh, let's turn on stereo and try this right away. So let's see if he's uh, ignoring us. He might be. Yep. So all I have to do is uh, AI ignore player zero. There we go. So now he reacts to us and he jumps right at us. So we see that looks really nice in 3D. So there he goes. He's using that smart object and he gets up there. And now he's trying to get a much better angle to shoot at me. So he's going to run around the world trying to get all sorts of angles on me using the smart objects. I don't even know where he's gone now. So now uh, we'll use Flowgraph to do that. And I'll just do one simple uh, AI go to just to show you how that works. And uh, now I'm going to make a Flowgraph on this character. So I go create, new, AI go to. And I add a couple nodes in here. So I'm only going to add three. So this is a game start node, kind of a general node. Uh, if it's in game, if it's the editor, I'll put a signal. So it's pretty straightforward. Then we have AI. So then we have this uh, AI go to, and I sign him to that. Oops. I'll put to sync, and now all I have to do is give him some sort of position to go to. And how I do that is by using a little helper that I use um, called the tag point. So I just put an entity position in there. Now we just need to select this tag point. So I grab a tag point. Now we can decide anywhere in the world to put this guy. So uh, he's facing this way, so I'm happy to sort of move him this direction. Uh, maybe we'll move him to this corner here somewhere. So this is actually a pretty long way for him to go. He's got to navigate through all this, uh, all this stuff. There's a lot of navigation to do. So um, what I'm going to do, I assign my uh, entity, feed the position to position, and it's that easy. I don't have to save. I don't have to compile, none of that stuff. I just close that off. Um, and I don't even have to jump in game to test this. I can just hit AI physics. And as soon as I hit AI, he's on his way to the point. So he's just walking to the point uh, because we've told him to walk in that node. I have to open up the flow graph again just to uh, tell him to run to the point instead of walk. Uh, wow. Uh, here we go. So you see that it says uh, run or walk or whatnot. So there's run. And I can tell him to ignore me. Um, so that's probably going to be easier to follow him. So I'll just have him ignore me. So I close that off, and now I jump in game, and he should be running to that point and back. So let's see if we can follow him. All right, so here we go. So he's up using his smart object. There we go. I made that jump. I'm trying to follow him. He's pretty quick. There it goes. So uh, that's exactly how we control the AI. So I mean, that's a really simple example. It can get really complex, um, or the flow graph can get very big, but it's a, it's a pretty nice way to do it, actually. So there we go. We just finished him off, put him out of his misery from doing all these commands. We have a team of how many right now in Crisis 2, do we say? 
yeah, 300 or so. So, I mean, we have a lot of lead designers, um, and uh, we even have these these guys in a, we call it the pit right now. Um, yeah, it's designers plus AI programmers, um, plus even a creative art directors. So, it's really... It's interesting the way we do things. We use Scrum a lot within the company, so I mean that's a good way to, to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be. So, um, but a lot of times, yeah, it's just quality control and uh, having really good art direction, having really good design direction, uh, having good leads. Really, uh, that's that's the way we, we really get it. The tools are getting better, but with the increase in the tools, we actually didn't make our development time shorter. We've we've kept it about the same because what the what the better tools give us the ability to do is iterate more. So basically, we can make the game better uh, in the same amount of time um, because I can iterate things like that AI and keep jumping in game and trying it and trying it and trying it and trying it.